Thanks, Aaron. Okay, I'm back. You're stuck with me again for my third and final Ignite session um, as we continue barrel through. I think we're halfway done, right? This is five and there's nine all together. We're more than halfway done. So um, congratulations to all of you for showing up to the session so far. Um, and I know there's a lot of uh, great information planned for the back half of Ignite. And today we are going to cover two topics. So just like I promised on Monday, we are going to be going over uh, buyer system, how to work effectively with buyers. And we're also going to be talking a little bit about setting goals. That's, and that's where we're going to start today. So Erin um, is my wing woman for the class. So she's going to be monitoring the chat. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in there. And, um, and I want to be cognizant of our time. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and then we will be off and running. Um, okay, so today, like I mentioned, we're going to cover two separate topics. We're going to talk a little bit about setting goals. And so you'll want to make sure that you have a paper and pen handy because it's going, you're going to set some goals for yourself during this class. And then we're going to go through how to effectively work with buyers. So the last session, we went through how to effectively work with sellers. And I hope that you guys got a lot of value out of that class. If you missed any portion of it, uh, we have the recording. And I think it will be processed and posted in the next day or so. So we'll get that up for you. Um, and so that's what we are aiming to cover today. And we always start with this slide. Now you guys are in your fifth Ignite class. So you know that we always start with this slide. And this is just a friendly reminder of what successful agents do every day. So what successful agents do every day. So they do, they grow their business and they run their business. And the growing the business side looks like lead generating for buyers and sellers, making seller listing presentations to get listings, making buyer presentations, which is what we're talk, gonna talk about today. Um, to get buyer uh, agreements and then previewing real estate so that you are the um, agent who knows the market best in your target area. Um, they also run their business. So they market seller listings, right? For more listings and some buyer clients. They show buyers houses. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, coming up in future Ignite sessions, you're going to hear about negotiating contracts and the transaction management process. Uh, you also, on a day-to-day -day basis, will deal with vendor management, like uh, inspector and attorney referrals, right? Talking to title companies and, that, and uh, things of that nature. Um, there's always the compliance end of running a real estate business, right? You are licensed by New York State to help people transact hundreds of thousands of dollars. That is a big responsibility. And so there's always going to be the compliance and risk management side of running a real estate business that's important um, and, and, and it keeps you out of hot water, right? Uh, attending training and get coaching, which everybody on this call is good at because you're here today with me. And of course, managing your money, which is also something that we're going to talk about today once we get into um, the information about setting goals. Okay, so just like I was saying, today we're really going to focus on lead generating for buyers and sellers. We're going to talk a little bit about making buyer presentations and, and getting buyer agreements. We're going to kick off everything with setting goals and um, talk a little bit about managing money. Um, so can somebody come off mute and read the quote on the screen for me? I'll take one volunteer. I have no problem waiting. Someone will do it. Go ahead, Jean. Oh. Okay. Who we are and where we want to go determine what we do and what we accomplish. That's right. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Jean. You're welcome. Yeah. So who we are and where we want to go determine what we do and what we accomplish. And so I'm sure everybody sitting on this call when they got their real estate license did it with some idea about what they wanted their real estate business to look like, right? I know when I was getting my real estate license, it wasn't just because for fun, right? A fun, fun something to do on the weekends. I had a real vision about how I wanted to run my business. And so that is what we're going to talk a little bit about at the top of the hour is 
Um, how do you set goals big enough for your business so that when we're talking about doing these activities, you are, you're excited to get up in the morning and do them, right? And so what we know is true is, and this is from The One Thing, by the way. So if anybody has not yet read The One Thing, it is an amazing book. It's, one, it's part of um, Gary Keller's imprint. It is a book all about time management. I am going to teach you a secret. I coached over 100 newly licensed agents. Now, over the past year, I have coached a lot of top producing real estate agents and middle group of agents that are getting their business up and running. And there is a central theme that I see with all agents, nine times out of 10, it can be boiled down to this one thing, their ability to effectively manage their time. Your ability to effectively manage your time will make or break your success in this business. You can quote me on it because it's not my quote, it's just a fact. So we talk a lot about Time management, the one thing is a really awesome book that you can pick up. You can get it on Kindle or you can buy it in a store. Um, and it's all about time management hacks, right? And this can be applicable for all stages of your business. Now, when you're a newly licensed agent, we're, we're telling you, you have to sit in nine sessions and take Ignite and learn all of this stuff. And then you want to go to new agent orientation. And then you have to learn this huge tech platform that we have for you. And it's called Command. And then you, we want you to come and take this class and meet with your coach, your productivity coach every week, right? And you might be thinking, oh my goodness, how am I going to have the time to do all of this plus grow my business? And the secret is that you absolutely can do both, right? But it's going to come down to how um, how effectively you're able to manage your time. And I'm going to give you a couple of hacks to um, master that in today's class. So this is one of the, um, the models right out of the One Thing book. And you'll see on the left axis, it's thinking. So the bottom would be small thinking. The, lar the top side is big thinking. And then this, uh, the, the horizontal axis is time and effort. So obviously this is when you first get licensed and then down here is time and effort towards your actions. And that is what is going to lead to either big or small outcomes. So time will continue to tick regardless of what we do each day, right? Regardless of whether or not we go out and set an appointment today for ourselves, the day will still go by. So the question then is, are you going to be somebody who each day as this time and effort line continues to tick with your new real estate license, is your thinking about your real estate business going to also grow? Where is your thinking about your real estate business right now, right? What do you believe you can accomplish with your real estate career, with your real estate license? If you're thinking that um, if you're thinking small, unfortunately, what you might see is that you're then doing small actions, right? You're only lead generating a couple times of a week. You're kind of sporadically attending trainings. You're not really engaged with your coaching, right? If that's the, the, the outcome, time and effort is going to keep ticking by and you're going to see at the at a result, small outcomes. Now, conversely, when you have your, oh my gosh, what just happened? When you have, when your actions and your thinking is big, that's going to automatically propel you to make big actions, right? And big actions are always going to um, lead to big outcomes. And there are a lot of people in our company that started right in the seat that you're all in. Here's another secret. Every top producer was a new agent at one point. Nobody is born being a top producing real estate agent. Everybody sat with their new shiny real estate license and said, I need to go figure out where to get my first client from, myself included, right? We all start out that way. The difference is the people that see the massive outcomes that build the big businesses that hit, hit their goals consistently, that you strive to maybe want to, to mirror in your business are the ones that with time and effort and a big goal behind it, um, start to see some big results. Okay, let me switch to the next. Okay, so now this is a second, um, a second model also from the one thing. 
And it basically just shows exactly what we were talking, um, talking about, right? So the bigger that your thinking can be, the bigger that your, that your actions will show up to be and the bigger outcomes you will ultimately um, receive. So if you're taking notes, I'd like you to take a second. We'll take one minute. And I want you to be honest and think for a minute. And I want you to write down, is there a way that you're limiting yourself with your new real estate business? Or with your, it doesn't have to be a new real estate business. I know not everybody on the call is a new, newly licensed realtor. Is there a way, is there something that you're thinking about your real estate business right now that might limit you from these big outcomes and taking big action? Maybe it's that you're, you're um, nervous to call your sphere of influence and you're just hoping that somebody's going to see a, a, the Facebook post that you made and they're going to call you. Maybe it's that you don't um, feel like you have the time to lead generate every day. Maybe it's that you feel like scripts are too scripted and it's going to make you sound like a salesperson. And so you're hesitant to learn scripts and dialogues of the real estate business. Be honest. I know when I was newly licensed, I had, I had a few of these. I had a few of these that I had to work through. And I worked through them with, with my coach. That's why we give you know everybody in the, in the office a coaching opportunity. So take one or two minutes and write down, is there a way you're limiting yourself with your new real estate business? And if there is, and if you're being honest and there is, then who can help you work through that, right? Is it a coach, right? Is it one of the productivity coaches in the office? We have three awesome productivity coaches, um, Patty, who's on the call, and Meralda and Rebecca. They're amazing. And they're here to help with that stuff, right? Are you digging into coaching with them to let them help you with that? Here's um, one of the limiting leaps I, I had when I was a newly licensed agent. So when I was newly licensed, I sat in Ignite and they told me to lead generate every day. And I did. And I put together a bunch of deals. It actually worked. The stuff they were telling me, surprise, actually led to business. So I had a, I put together like five or six real estate transactions and they were all under contract. And anybody who has man, managed a transaction that's gone under contract knows that there's, there is a lot of parts, moving parts to get a deal closed, right? At the time, we didn't have our awesome concierge service that we have now. So I didn't have that additional help of the paperwork and all of that stuff being done for me. I had to do it myself. And so I ended up spending a lot of my time being very nervous about these deals closing, right? This is going to be my first opportunity to make some money selling real estate. I desperately wanted to quit my first, my full-time job. And so making this money was so important to me because it was going to help me build a bubble to do that. And so I was just hyper-focused on getting that deal closed, right? And then what happened? All of my deals closed, five or six deals. And then I turned around and I said, I have no more business. I don't have any active clients. I have no pipeline. I do not have listings lined up. I haven't been lead generating every day. I've spent all day worried about the contract to close with these deals that I haven't, that I took my foot off the pedal of lead generation. And then it was like starting all over again, right? Now I needed to build up a whole new book of business. And so that's this, this, cycle is not limited to newly licensed agents. I am here to tell you that experienced agents do this cycle, that top producers fall into this cycle of putting a bunch of business together, getting so busy with the business that you forget the money making part of selling real estate. I don't know if anybody else has ever heard this when you were getting licensed. If Did somebody say to you, Selling real estate is not consistent money. You can't make consistent money through selling real estate. Maybe that's something that you thought, right? Or somebody told you or a real, another real estate agent even said to you, right? I'm here to tell you that is absolutely not true. You can absolutely make a consistent income, predictable, consistent income through selling real estate. And this model is the key to it. It's time and effort and how big your actions are going to be and how big your thinking is going to be about your business, right? 
So somebody that's just focused on getting the deals managed and getting through the through the process of the contract to close, time and effort is going to keep ticking along and you might then receive small outcomes. Some now don't don't um, mishear me, right? You can't drop your deals off the side of a cliff and not pay attention to them and expect them to close, right? And you can do that and also do the business building activities every single day. Um, I'll give you an example of Brian Kaplicki, who works out of our Middletown office. He runs the number one team in that office he has for many years. I called Brian uh, two weeks ago, and I know Brian because I, I worked in that office for many years, and I, and I know that this to be true. So I called Brian. I asked him if he would talk to one of our newly licensed agents who wanted to pick his brain on new construction, which he does a lot of. And he said, yeah, no problem. And I said, okay, she said she could call you around 11. And he was like, no, that is my lead generation time. She can call me anytime after 12. That's when I take phone calls. And that's my appointment block. But until 12, please don't tell her I will not be able to pick up until 12. This is someone who leads a team that sells probably, that's the top team in the office. They sell a lot of real estate. And he still comes in every single day and lead generates. Anybody who has worked out of that office knows that when you walk in the door, usually Brian's there. He's the first person in the door. Right, Aaron? Aaron worked with Brian for many years. Oh, and yeah. He's, he's usually in around seven. Right. In around seven, he gets prepared. He sits down and he lead generates and he knows his numbers and he, and he makes his calls and he does all of that. And this is somebody that at any given time could have 30 plus deals pending, right? Does a very large volume of business. And so if he's able to manage all of that, so, so are we. And so that's when we talk about big thinking. Brian has a big thinking and a big vision for his business that involves him consistently adding buyers and sellers into his pipeline. And so that might be your plan and you might have a different goal, right? Again, there's no right or wrong way or no right or wrong goal to have around your real estate business. The idea is that whatever you want to do, you're able to build a big life with it. And so what I want you to do is I, is I want to take five minutes with this exercise. And I want you to take a piece of paper and draw out this chart. So you're going to put a circle in the middle. Don't put a dollar amount in it yet. Draw a circle in the middle and draw five lines. And then the boxes like you see on the screen here. Rectangles. So a circle in the middle, five rectangles, lines connecting the rectangles to the circle. So this activity is going to help you envision your big life. And again, everyone is going to have a different vision. There's no right or wrong vision for your life. And your vision from your life is going to be different from the next person that I'm looking at on my screen, right? So Jean's is gonna be different from Connie's, from different from John's, different from Patty's, right? You're each gonna have a different vision for your life and they're all great. And you wanna make sure that, they're, that they are big visions so that you can push through and set big goals for yourself. So what I want you to do is in each one of those five, um, five rectangles, Write a person or a cause that you care about or a goal that you want to achieve with your real estate business. So you see the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the examples here. Austin Pets Alive, donate a cat habitat. Um, Sarah and Hunter, somebody that they care about, get through school debt free. Mom and dad pay off mortgage, right? Yours doesn't ha have to be other people. It could be goals for yourself, right? So write down five big goals that you have for your life. As you're writing those goals, tie a dollar amount to it. How much money are you going to need to, to tie a dollar amount to it? When I was... Um, a newer agent, an agent looking to grow my business, my goals revolved around being able to quit my full-time job. I wanted to sell real estate full-time and I needed to have consistent, reliable income to do that and a certain amount in my savings account in order to do that. So that would have been one of my rectangles with, my, um, with the dollar amount that's involved there. I also had a goal of paying off some debt. So that was, that would have also been one of my triangles. Um, 
at one point, my, one of my goals was to help my husband get into business with me. That certainly took a certain dollar amount um, that we were able to hit. So those are a couple of mine and yours will be totally different. And I'll stop talking and you guys can fill give, I'll give you three minutes to fill in all five of your rectangles. Okay, take one more minute and make sure anything you're writing in your rectangles has a dollar amount tied to it. Okay, if you have all five of your rectangles written out and if you need some more time to think about it, that's okay. Just write an A in the, in the margin and circle it so that it's a reminder when you're going back over your notes later that you wanna continue to do this. So if you have all five of your things circled, then what I want you to do, um, some of you might have already done this already, is add up the dollar amount that you gave to each one of these rectangles. So what is the total dollar amount that you gave for each one of these rectangles. So what is it going to cost you to do all of these five things that you just set out for yourself? Is that amount of money that you're adding up and writing into your circle going to help you create your big life? If it is, that's great. If it's not yet, well, how much do you need to add to it to set a goal for yourself, right? What is your goal for the year? So sometimes I know that we, um, when, when, you're, um, when you're working on creating a business plan, right, which is one of the first things you want to do to, when you're putting together your real estate business, one of the first questions we ask you is, what is your income goal for the year? And for a lot of people, that's hard to determine. Not everybody knows off the top of their head what their income goal is for the year. I hear things like, I just want to make more than I made last year. I want to make more than I made at my job, my last job that I worked at, right? Um, and, and so I know sometimes it can be hard to quantify really what you need to make in order to live a big life. And if you need this money that you put into these five rectangles here, if that's going to help you live a big life, does that help you tie some more purpose to some of the activities that we might be asking you to do that makes you feel uncomfortable, like talking to your sphere of influence, maybe doing an open house and talking to strangers, right? If you know at the end of the day, 
by doing this, you're going to be able to do the five things that you wrote out in this, these rectangles, plus whatever else you want to do, because you can do whatever else you want to do, right? And add some fun money in on top. Does that help you quantify a big vision so that when you set big goals for yourself, you're motivated to do the big activities that it takes to sell a, to run a successful real estate business? Okay, now once you've set that big goal, what we have to do is we're, we treat you all like business owners because you are. You just started a small business if you've just gotten licensed. If you've been licensed, you, you have owned a small business for however long you've been licensed. I've owned my small business for seven, little over seven years. My real estate business is a small business. We do not treat you like salespeople. That's one of the things that's always going to set us apart from other brokerages is that we don't look at our agents as sales staff or sales people on our, um, on our dole that we want just to run around in, in the world selling things for the brokerage. We look at you as a small business owner. That's, and so part of being a small business owner is that you have to have a business structure and a business model, usually an income goal, a budget, and you're also going to have business expenses. Just like any other business, you're going to have business expenses. Okay, so what we're, um, so what we're looking at here is a dollar bill and where it goes when you make a commission, right? So when you set that big goal for yourself, your big income goal, what you need to take into account is whether or not you, um, well, I guess it wouldn't even be whether or not. So the big income goal you set on the prior screen is how much money you need sitting in your bank account. At the at, by the you know during the duration of the year to use towards the big things that are going to fund your life. Now here's the the trick: you cannot just generate that amount of money because if you generate just that amount of money, you're not going to be looking at your business like a business owner and taking into consideration the different business expenses that you have when you run a real estate uh, real estate business. So some of those expenses could look like splitting the total commission if you're the listing agent, if there's a buyer's agent involved, right? You have a split with the brokerage. We're a capped commission model, but you do have a split with the brokerage until you hit your cap. Now, just like any other business owner, you have business expenses to run your business, right? And then, and then what's left over after that is your take home. So this should be a calculation. Uh, so we're going to walk through a calculation so that you can see how many units you need to sell as a newly licensed agent. And I'm, sh and I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because I am, I, am, um, I am confident that many of you on this call have already done this with your productivity coach. If you haven't, you should have. You should ask them to do this with you, right? If you need help um, doing this, uh, you haven't done it yet, you can let me know, you can let your PC know, and we'll walk you through if you have questions, but it's pretty self-explanatory. So this is how we're going to ultimately decide based on that big life, how do we create a big life that's going to get you to that big income goal for yourself? What does that mean logistically in terms of how many homes you need to sell? So the first thing that we need to look at is what your average sales price is. And again, every person in this call is going to have a different average sales price. You might be saying, I don't have a different average sales price. I haven't sold anything yet. How do I know, right? If that's the case, then you can use an average sales price for the area within which you sell real estate. If you don't know what that is, then you need to go back to studying the market, right? That's the main job of a real estate agent, studying the market. You should have an idea about what your average sales price is in your target area. Um, I know we ran stats yesterday at the team meeting. I believe right now the Ulster County um, median price is mid threes, like around 350. Green County is 320,000. Uh, Dutchess County is 400,000. Um, I'm not sure what Rockland and Orange are. Um, I'm sure that they are at least in the threes. I would guess Rockland is more in the fours um, someplace. So Again, if you're not sure of these of this number, um, and take an estimate, right? Now, here's here's my soapbox a caveat. So when I was doing this, um, when I was doing this this example, we used, I think at the time the average sales price was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So that's what we were using. And so I had broken down how many units I needed to sell, and I didn't take into consideration that at the time 
when I got my real estate license, I was in my mid twenties. And most of my clients were my sphere of influence who are first time home buyers, right? People my age buying homes and their average budget was not $250,000. Their average budget was usually under $200,000. And so I, when I hit the numbers I needed to hit for the year, I actually didn't hit the income goal because I used the wrong average sales price estimate. So all of this to say, you, if you don't know your number now, estimate it. And this is why we ask, tell you to track your numbers, right? We need to keep track to see if halfway through the year, is that really your average sales price, right? Is it higher or lower? Some of you on the call might deal with a lot of people in the second home market, right? Especially in Ulster County, the second home market is, is going to be a much higher average sales price than if you're dealing with more local buyers and sellers, right? So we also have to understand kind of the local real estate market. So you want to write in your average sales price and then your average commission, your side of the commission. So in this example, they're using 300000 at a 3% commission. So again, this is going to vary right? It's going to vary based on location. It's going to vary on your ability to negotiate a commission for yourself if it's a listing. It's also going to vary based on whether or not um, what you're being offered through the MLS as a buyer's agent and whether or not you negotiate an additional amount on top of that. Um, so again, um, you can use a range here. If you just want to go through the exercise and then consult with your productivity coach after this to get real numbers for your area, just use the two in the example, 300,000 and 9,000 as your DCI. So that would be, when we talk about your gross commission income, you'll hear that referred to here at Keller Williams as your GCI. It's one of the main things that we talk to a lot about. So that is the amount of the check you actually hand into the market center not the amount of the money that's being deposited into your bank account. It's the dollar amount for the check that when you get to a closing, you're handing into the market center. Okay, so now the next thing that you need to understand is our, your cap, right? So we're a capped commission model. That means that you are either on one of two caps with our office. Ignore this 27,000. This is just an example and that's not our caps. So you are either on a cap that is $22,500 or you are on a cap that is $28,000. If you're somebody on a team, you might be on a different cap. You can fill in whatever your cap is there. But you're, all of you are probably on one, either the $28,000 cap or the $22,500 cap. Okay, you also have to take into consideration the franchise royalty, right? So we know that there's a franchise fee where we're all part of the largest real estate franchise in the country. And so just like any other franchise, there's a franchise fee, which is 6%. And that also caps, this is what sets us apart from other franchises, is that that also caps at $3,000. So you want to add these two numbers up, whatever your cap is plus $3,000. That's your total contribution to the office ever, right? On a yearly basis, ever. I shouldn't say ever. On a yearly basis, that's going to be your, your, the, 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 um, the maximum that you will contribute to the market center. And then anything further than that, you become capped and you uh, receive 100% of your commission. Okay, so these two numbers are what's called your cost of sales. So write that down. These two numbers are what's called your cost of sales as a business owner. So your gross, your GCI is your first number that you need to know. That's the total amount of business revenue, essentially, that you need to bring in to the door. Now, one of your, you have two different line items for expenses. One of them is your cost of sales. That's your split to the market center. There's really nothing else in a cost of sale, right? It's, it's usually just the split. Um, unless you have, um, if you have a transaction fee on your, um, on your commission plan, that could also be a cost of sale. The cost of sales is a cost that is only incurred when you sell a house. Okay. Okay. So what we're, what we want to do is we want to take all of these things together and then get down to your annual transaction goal. So what we want to do is get the net income uh, oh no, add your net income goal in here. So that's the number that's in your circle on from two screens back. So whatever your net income goal was, right, is whatever's in that circle. That's what you're going to net. Okay, 
Then the next thing you want to add in below that is B, which is your company dollar and your royalty cap. That's whatever we had on the previous screen. So it's either going to be 28,000 plus 3,000 or 22,500 plus 3,000, depending on which um, commission plan you're on. Now, number C, this is where you need to probably estimate what your own expenses are going to be. And what you're looking at is on a yearly basis. So on a yearly basis, how much money will you set aside to run your business? That looks like money for advertising, for networking, paying your MLS dues, buying business cards, buying signs, um, doing any type of marketing, outbound marketing, or paying for a lead sources, running ads through commands, paying for those types of lead sources, right? If you're saying, I don't know, and also I don't even really have a big budget, that's okay. Um, what I would like you to do is think on a monthly basis based on your income right now or the reserves that you have to grow your business, how much money can you allocate towards running a real estate business? Now, let me just say that you do not need $50,000 like in this example. You don't need $50,000 to make $100,000 in real estate, okay? You can make real you can make $100,000 from much less than 50,000 and that's if you really dig into your sphere, some of the cheap lead sources we have in the office so on and so forth. So think on a monthly basis, how much money can you spend? Can you allocate and then multiply that by 12 and that becomes your yearly business expense. Okay, now what you want to do is add all three of those A, B, and C up, right? So take your net income goal, add in your cost of sales, which is your company dollar and royalty cap, add in your business expenses, and that's going to give you your total GCI. So that's your total GCI there. So you see in this example, it's $180,000. So what does that mean? That means that um, you need to come into the office and hand deliver $180,000 worth of commission checks, okay? And then from there, you will pay down your cap and be at zero. You will cover all of your business expenses and you will have $100,000 sitting in your bank account free and clear well, not free and clear of taxes, but free and clear um, as your net income. So now what you want to do once you have that is you want to take your average GCI that you set. So in this example, they use 9,000 years might be different. And all you're doing here is dividing your total GCI by your average commission check. Okay, now as you continue to sell real estate, there are a ton of reports that you get um, that you get access to. Some of them are in command on the, under the report section. There's also a document called your multi-year trends. I'm not gonna go over a full review, just know that word, multi-year trends. As you continue to sell real estate, that is a very handy dandy tool that will pull up all of these numbers for you so that you don't have to guesstimate. So when you take your total GCI and you average it out by the average commission check that you receive, right, your average GCI, that's going to give you your annual transaction goal. So that's how many homes you need to sell on an annual basis if on average your GCI lines up in order to generate the total amount of income that you're looking to make to make all five of those things come true that you made in your little rectangles. Any questions about this um, This. Uh, formula, this model. Any questions? It's pretty straightforward. This is called your economic business model. It's one of the four business models that Gary Keller talks about in the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, right? So this is your first one. It's your economic business model. Now that you have this done, your next model is your lead generation model, right? Now, if you know that you need to close 20 houses, that we have to figure out how many leads do you need to be to have on, um, on a regular basis in order to get to the closing table with 20 buyers or sellers and a combination of both, right? From there, you, once you do that really well, 
Um, you might have an organizational model. That's the model we use to help you grow a team. You definitely will have a budget model, right? That tells you how you should budget certain expenses in your business to make sure that you're always profitable. And then the fifth model is the expansion model. That is when you've done all four of those things great and you have a really awesome team running locally, how do you take that and duplicate that across multiple geographic areas and run what's called expansion teams? We have certain agents in our company that run teams all across the country, expansion teams of agents that follow their systems and models and their lead generation sources, and they dig in and they sell, my, um, sell real estate with them. So again, when we're talking about thinking big, right, setting big goals for yourself and thinking really big. The people that are running these expansion model teams are really big thinkers, right? They are somebody that were at some point was a newly licensed agent, just like you, probably sat through and went through Ignite, did this calculation and said, great, I'm going to go out and, and do this. And then they built a really good solo agent business for themselves. They did all of the activities that they need to do to build a really good solo agent business for themselves that opened up the opportunity to build a team underneath them, right? They had a solid structure that then they could build a team underneath them with. And then they did that team really well, right? And they helped their team members hit their goal. And then at that point, those big thinkers came to Gary Keller and they said, we don't want to just have this one team in our one market center. We want to take what we know works really well off this basis that I built as a single agent, as a team member. And we want to duplicate this all over the place. And that's where the expansion model came in, right? We have some agents in our company that are in all 50 states and have hundreds of teams, hundreds of teams. There's thousands of agents working for some of these people. And so when we talk about thinking big, right? If they had stopped and just thought, well, I sold 20 houses this year and that's awesome. Let me sell 20 again next year. If that's your goal, that's okay. And is that thinking big enough? Is that thinking about the possibilities that now are afforded to you um, because of your partnership with KW? Okay, so somebody, I need another volunteer. Oh, wait, where am I? Here we are. I need another volunteer to come off mute and read. John, I see you off mute. Oh, okay. Accountable people achieve results other, others can only dream of. That's awesome. Thank you. This is also from the one thing. Accountable people achieve results others can only dream of. So when we're talking about these big goals and these big systems and the model behind it to help you hit that, what my question for you would be, who's holding you accountable to that, right? Who is going to help you hit your big goals? Who is going to help you hit your big goals? Is it, one, is it a coach? Usually the person that's holding you accountable is somebody that you're in a coaching relationship with, right? How can your coach help you hold accountable to reaching your big vision? I know all of our productivity coaches have a goal of helping you hit your big vision for your business. Do, do you share that vision with your coach so that each week when you're working with them, they're helping you walk through it? Is that the reason why our productivity coaches ask you guys to track your numbers on a weekly basis, right? It's not because they wanna be your, teacher, they want to micromanage you, they want to make sure that they are holding you accountable to hitting your big goals that you set out when you got your real estate business. And so accountability is one of the things also that I think is sets um, really successful business owners apart from people that peter out. It's that it's that accountable consistency um, over time and being able to uh, master your, your schedule and your time management, everything else is just activities, right? If you're able to be to set big goals that you want to hold yourself accountable to, you allow somebody hold, to hold you accountable to it and you run a schedule that helps you do that, you will see results. There is no way you will not see results from doing that. Okay, any questions on anything that we have covered so far? All right, so we're going to pivot into um, buyers, talking about working with buyers, all things working with buyers. I'm gonna share my buyer system with you. We'll take a five minute break really quick. We'll give everybody a chance to stretch your legs, 
Um, think a little more about your big goals and then we'll come back at 9.51. Okay, we're back. All right, so we're gonna talk all things buyers. <clears throat> so buyers are, <clears throat> buyers are an important part, right, of running a healthy real estate business. What we tell agents is that a healthy real estate business is 50% buyers and 50% sellers. Why is that helpful? That's helpful because as the market shifts around, it's good to have pools from both sides, right? So if we're in a seller's market and you're lead generating for sellers and for listings, is it helpful to be able to say to your sellers, I have an, a pool of qualified buyers 
that are looking for homes right now that I might be able to match with your home before you have to go through the hassle of putting it on the market, having people come in and out of your house, which right now, especially with COVID, sometimes people are a little reserved and nervous about doing, right? Can you say that? Does it increase your options if you have a pool of buyers and you're taking listings? Does it increase your options that you will find the buyer for that listing and therefore get both sides of the deal and make more money? Yes, it does. So even when listings are good, you want to make sure that you also are working with buyers. So while we say focus on lead generating for listings, it doesn't mean that you don't want to also take on buyer clients. And then when the market shifts, which eventually it will shift again, and we'll be back into a buyer's market, it is very helpful to have a lead generation source that gets you buyer leads, right? And so when it's much easier for buyers to write offers and get houses, you want to have those buyers um, on deck to be able to, to buy homes. So um, now you can, there's many different ways to lead generate for buyer listings. I think the best way to lead generate for buyer listings is or for buyer, for buyer clients is just to go out and take listings. I know I've said that a lot, but it's the truth, right? So when you take a listing, here are a lot of ways that you can advertise I and mean, then some of them will bring you buyers. So number one, when you take a listing, you can run a Facebook ad through commands. You can either make a, just a post on your business page, or you can run a paid ad through commands, through the campaign section in commands. You will get leads and they will be buyers. Now, the key with that is that you're getting the leads come in and then you're putting them onto smart plans that are following up with them for long enough so that you're starting to see results. Okay. That's one way that your listing can help you get buyers. You can also send out just listed postcards. Sometimes what you'll find is that just by focusing on just listed postcards, which usually goes out to the houses in the area, sometimes you will catch somebody that's renting and thinking about buying. Sometimes you will get a seller lead. And if somebody is selling, they have to buy something usually. They're not usually selling and going to rent. They're usually selling to buy. Right. So the just listed postcards could get you listings plus a listing, somebody that wants to sell and buy. Your listings, they need to buy, right? That's an easy way to get a buyer. Sell their house. Then they got it. They nine times out of ten, they're gonna buy something. They're not always gonna buy something in this market, and that's okay. Even if they but they will be a buyer somewhere. And you if you can connect them with the Keller Williams agent wherever they're going, you can collect a referral fee from that, right? Um, you can also do open houses. Open houses are a great source of buyer leads. Even if you don't have your own listings yet, offer to host open houses for agents in the office. I know John has done that. He's offered out to the agents in our office to host open houses for them. Usually the rule of thumb is that if you're hosting the open house, anybody that walks in the door is your lead to keep, right? That is a great way to find buyer leads. You get belly to belly with people. You get to be in a house. You get to have a conversation. Um, and I think we, we very frequently do an open house class that will teach you how to do it from soup to nuts to get a ton of people in the door. That's a great way to take a listing, market it for buyer leads. You can also send out just listed and just sold emails to your database. So if everybody in your phone is in your database and command, and you are, list a house, you can send out a just listed email through command and they will be, and they will get it. There could be somebody in there that's thinking about buying or selling or know somebody that's thinking about buying or selling. So that's another way that you can use your listings to lead generate for buyers. Some other lead generation ideas might be hosting a, a, a first time home buyer seminar. I know that um, Kim Lozano in the New City office is really awesome at first time home buyer seminars. She had 70 people at the last one she did, which is insane. It's insane. I mean, yes, she has cornered the market on it. We should have her teach a class, Erin. I'm sure she would. I know she would on how to do it. Um, first time home buyer seminars, another good way to get buyers, um, find buyer leads. You can also do networking stuff. People do like the Dutchess County Fair is coming up, right? The Ulster County Fair was just happening. I'm sure the Orange County Fair happens at some point. We live in an area where there's constantly fairs and flea markets and craft shows and things going on all summer, right? Can you find something every summer that you could potentially sponsor? Now, again, we just set your budget. So you have to make sure that it's in line with your budget, your budget for your business. 
but that's a great way to collect some leads. And they might not always be buyer leads. They could be seller leads too. That's another way to lead generate. Make friends with your nearest mortgage broker or your nearest insurance agent or your nearest attorney, right? They know what's going on with their clients. Nine times out of 10, we become the referral source. So the person, um, so the person comes to the realtor first and then the realtor kind of disseminates out to them uh, different, different, leads, uh, different people, attorneys, home inspectors, so on and so forth. But that's not always the case. Sometimes people do go get pre-approved first and talk to a mortgage broker and the mortgage broker is going to ask them, do you have a realtor yet? Right. And they're, they'll, they're going to refer them to somebody. So go out there and make some business to business connections. That's another way to lead generate for buyers. So there's tons of ways to lead generate for buyers. Um, and, and I would say the one that you will get the biggest results from is by lead generating for listings and taking listings and marketing them. If you don't have any listings yet, if you're in my office, you can market any of our ALC's listings, okay? So our ALC is Davina, uh, Beth Outfeld, Vicki Wolper, Patty Kowach, and Lee Quintana. And they all take a lot of listings, let me tell you. You have open range to market any of them. I'm sure in the other offices, if you approached your ALC, they would be more than happy to let you. I'm sure in your office, even if you approach somebody that wasn't on the ALC, they'd be more than happy to let you market their listing, right? We take a lot of listings in this office in a big, wide area. So go out there, even if you don't have a listing yet, find a listing and market it. Ask them to post an open house. Ask them if, they, if you can run an ad. Here's the win-win. This is the way that you can pitch it to one of the more experienced agents. If you're asking them if you can market their home, you can say, hey, John, I love that house that you just listed on Main Street um, in New Paltz. I would love to throw some marketing dollars behind it and run a Facebook ad. If, um, if you're okay with me doing that, I will, um, I will, of course, keep the leads that are generated from the marketing spend, but I'll list you on the bottom as the listing agent. And afterwards, I will send you the report so that you can send that to your seller and say, hey, we just got your home in from front of an additional five or 10,000 people for free, right? Now the listing agent doesn't have to spend that money. You're getting the leads. And then when, if you're saying, okay, that's cool. What is that report? It's literally just the dashboard. You can do a screenshot in command of the campaign and it will show there the impressions and the leads and all of those things that you can send to that listing agent afterwards and let them um, and let them send to their seller. So use the office's listings if you don't have any of your own. And um, and and what I'm not I'm not going to run through the full lead generation model, but I will briefly touch on it. Give me one second and let me share my screen again. Yes. Okay, so this is a lead generation model. So we talked a little bit about this morning. We did. Um, most of most of the portions of your um, of your economic business model, this is your lead generation model. So there's always two. This is as a solo agent. So the top here is lead generation. There's always two activities you're doing when you're looking to build your business: prospecting and marketing. Right. So prospecting is outbound prospecting, talking to people, outbound talk. You know, putting yourself out there. Marketing is more passive. Right. Passive lead generation. You could also call these two active and passive lead generation. So prospecting is active lead generation. That's where you want to spend most of your time. And then you want to also have some passive lead generation strategies. And that looks like marketing. That could be social media. That could be postcards. That could be whatever else you're doing to market yourself, right? Um, once you do that, as you're doing that, you're going to capture your leads. So you'll see this looks like a funnel because it is a funnel. It's a lead funnel. So all the leads that you're capturing are going to go in the top of the funnel. And so notice the largest point of this funnel is the top, right? What does that mean? It is the top because you're, you need to put the most people in here. You need the largest volume in this category. Now, from here, you're going to divide your people up into two categories. They're either going to be leads, right, or they're going to be contacts. So somebody that is a lead is a one-way communication and an offer based on a touch program. Okay, so these are people, say you run a Facebook ad for one of the listings in the office and you get some leads in, which you will, 
into your command database. Now, the second thing that you wanna do is you need to put them onto a smart plan within the system. Here's what you need to understand about buyer leads. Most buyers will look for about six months at the market before they ever want a realtor saying anything or contacting them. That doesn't mean that they're bad leads. It just means that they are still in the nurture process of collecting information and figuring out timing for buying something. So the key with these buyers is to catch them when they're in this beginning stage and then to follow up with them consistently so that you are top of mind with them when all of a sudden you they decide that they want to speak with a realtor now and it's time to actually start looking for homes, right? They're going to do this in a couple of ways. Whoever is top of mind, they're either going to just call them. They're either just going to call them, right, and reach out to them. Or if nobody's top of mind, they will likely end up on one of the third-party searching websites where they're going to click a button and an agent is going to call them, okay? So you don't want that to happen. You want them to call you. So as you're, as you're collecting these leads, you need to follow up with them, especially buyer leads, okay? Um, seller leads. So that's the leads category. Now, again, so when you when you capture these leads, they're going to fall into one of two buckets. That's your lead category. The other one is your contacts. Contacts are people that you actually had a conversation with. So a contact would be a lead that you get at an open house that you have a conversation with that says, yes, I am thinking about buying a home. Um, no, I'm not working with a real estate agent. Yes, you can follow up with me after the after the open house, right? It might also be somebody calling you on a postcard that you sent out, right? So lead, so um, so contacts are people that you've actually had a conversation with. So down here is where you have to cultivate the lead. So both of these require different cultivation, right? The lead system is just gonna, they're just gonna want some market information. I'll, so I'll give you um, some information on a future slide about what type of follow-up system you use, you use for leads. For contacts, people that you're talking to, you should really um, be putting them into your pipeline, right? You should have be developing a pipeline of business where you're ranking these people based on when they're thinking about selling. So somebody that is an A that you're ranking as an A is somebody that wants to buy something within the next 14 days or as soon as they find the property, meaning that they're ready to start looking for homes now and they will write an offer as soon as, the home, as, soon as they find a home. Um, that they want to purchase. Somebody that is a B is somebody that's looking to buy more than two weeks out, but less than two months out. So between two weeks and two months out is when they want to start being in a position to look for homes. Somebody that is a C is somebody that is more than two months out from looking for a home. So they're not ready to really start looking for a home until more than two months out. So as you're getting these contacts, as you're making these connections, you wanna make sure that you're ranking your buyers as an A, B, or a C lead, because that's gonna tell you who you should follow up with and what frequency. Okay. Um, okay, so now say, so now you've talked to a buyer lead. So you have some leads coming in, you're talking to them, you're calling them on the phone and you, what you want to do with buyers is you want to set buyer consultation, a buyer consultation with them. Here is the biggest mistake that I see real estate agents make when it comes to buyers. The phone rings and it go, and they go, hi, I'm Rita. And I saw your property at 123 Main Street in New Paltz and I want to go see it. And the agent goes, okay, are you pre-approved? And they go, yeah, great. Are you working with a mortgage broker? Um, yeah, are, are, are you working with another realtor? No, great. What time do you want to see the property? Oh, two o'clock tomorrow. Perfect. I'll schedule the showing. Thanks, bye. And then they hang up the phone. And that's the whole conversation. That is the whole conversation. Here is what can happen if that is the conversations that you're having with buyer leads. Number one, they're not looking at you. You're not, you're not building rapport with them. You're not developing any type of relationship with these people to get them to see you as a fiduciary that's going to guide them through the home buying process, right? When you get one of those calls, what are they really looking at you at? They're looking at you as um, somebody in the way of them getting inside the door of the house that, they're, that they saw online that they want to go see. 
our job as a buyer's agent is to slow them down and do a buyer consultation so that you can convert more of those leads to being buyers that are actively working with you again and again so that you can work with them until you find them the home that they want to buy. If you are the person that is just saying, when do you want to see it? Okay, great. Click scheduling the showing and then meeting them at the house and showing them the house the likelihood that you can convert them from that point, unless they want to write an offer on that house, which is not going to be, I would say not the majority of the time, right? Majority of the time, it's not going to end up being that house that they end up writing an offer on. If you're not able to do a consultation and get into a relationship with them, I guarantee you will not show them any other properties, right? So this is what you want to do. You want to do an actual buyer consultation. And I will walk you through the basics of that. Now, just like we have a listing presentation, just like we have a listing presentation, we have a buyer consultation right in command in the design section. So that's what this slide is showing you. You can use designs and command to create a custom buyer presentation. Here's some things that I include in my um, buyer presentation. I'm not going to um, go through each page, but what you want to do is, well, let me start backwards. So just like we talked about sellers, right? What sellers are looking for is who is going to help them sell their home in the quickest time for the most amount of money. That is the vast majority of sellers are looking for that. What buyers are looking for is different. Buyers want an agent who understands the market and can help them get a good deal or in this market, a reasonable deal or in this market, a house because it's not given that the first two are going to happen, just like a house, helping them understand the market. So you do that by understanding the market at a high level, right? And then the second thing that buyers are really, really looking for in buyers agents is somebody who can help them make the process from contract to close go smoothly. They are looking for a handhold type of experience and a high level of customer service when they're working with a buyer's agent. The sellers want, they want a salesperson. They want somebody to sell their house quick, most amount of money, flashy marketing, all of that stuff that we went over. The buyers, it's, they, they're not as interested in sales. They want to know that you have an in-depth knowledge of the real estate market, right? Which if you're doing the daily 10 floor and you're previewing properties and you're looking on the MLS every day, like I talked about at the first session, you will know. And then they want to know that you that you have all the resources that they need to help them streamline the process from the time they get an accepted offer to the time you're actually handing them the keys at the closing. So your buyer consultation wants to touch on this, okay? So there's pages in command in the template that will help you explain um, how to do that effectively and what that is going to look like. You might also include in that presentation a list of trusted vendors that you use. So if anybody was in my, if you were in my first class, you already heard the story, but I'll tell it again. Um, when I uh, was first getting my license, I went on to Facebook and I messaged every person that I knew in my town that did something that I thought I could refer business to. So I went to high school and college in New Falls and I, then we were pretty active in the community for many years. So I knew a lot of people and I knew a mortgage broker and an insurance agent and a family photographer and um, a security alarm installer and a dry cleaner and all of these different things were like people that I knew in my sphere of influence. I went to them, I messaged them online and I said, hey, um, I don't know if you saw the news, but I just got my real estate license. I'm so excited I'm working with Keller Williams. And what I'm working on right now is putting together a packet of information to hand to any buyers, um, to ev not any, to every buyer that I work with. I have an opening for a blank, an accountant or whatever it is. I have an opening for an accountant. And of course, I thought of you. Would you be interested in being included? There's not, nobody that's going to say no. Everyone's going to say yes to that. They all said yes. I said, great. Um, what, what I need from you is, do you have any type of marketing collateral or just business cards that I can come get from you. And in return, I would love to take you to coffee as a thank you for being in my packet. And they're like, okay, cool. And then what happened? That was my one of part of my lead generation that week because I had a bunch of those coffee, you know, situations, business to business coffee networking meetings with those people. 
So I sat with them and it's 20 minutes and you ask them again, if you're nervous about networking, nervous about putting yourself out there, the person asking the questions controls the conversation. Just ask them a bunch of questions about their business. You, you don't need to worry that they're going to be like, how long have you been selling real estate? What are you, what, like they might ask you that stuff. And if you just ask them a bunch of questions, so oh, tell me about being an insurance broker. Do you do business policies? Do you do this? How long have you been doing this? Do you love it? Why do you work with the company you work with? How did you get into this? What were you doing before? Right? There's a million questions you could ask somebody about their career. Ask them those questions. Get the marketing materials. Now you'll notice leading up till that, I didn't say anything about referring me business. This was all one way. This is something that um, I'm looking to do for you. Now, once they handed me what they had, I would say to them, thank you so much hey, would you mind taking some of my business cards? And if you come across anybody thinking of buying or selling, you can feel free to pass them out. Nobody is going to be like, no, you take my stuff and I'm not going to take your stuff, right? Like everyone's like, yeah, great. They all took my business cards and I did get business from each one of them. So that long-winded story to say, now I actually had those names to include in this buyer packet, right? So it's a double whammy. You're networking, you're lead generating. And now you have a list of trusted vendors that you can refer people to. So that should be part of your buyer consultation packet that you are preparing. Okay. Um, so you want to make sure that you have that. So you need a listing presentation and a buyer presentation. If you create it and you want somebody to look at it, find your nearest productivity coach. And I'm sure they'd be happy to go over it with you and make sure that it looks um, good. All right, so also just like you have a seller lead sheet, you have a buyer lead sheet. And this is also in the Ignite toolkit. Um, I can upload the file to the chat too, so that you guys have it. So just like you should have those documents with the sellers on it, you should have a document with a buyer lead sheet right on it. And this is gonna give you um, the information that you need to go down and do an effective buyer consultation. And it's pretty straightforward, right? And most of these questions, the way that they're written, are um, are are the ways that you'll you'll want to be asking them. So, first question: Has an agent taken you out and shown you any properties? Notice this is different than: Are you working with a real estate agent? Everyone's definition of "Are you working with a real estate agent?" is going to be different. You'll hear from people sometimes. Oh, down the line, all of a sudden you'll discover, oh yeah, well, I did see properties with somebody else, but I didn't really, I wasn't really planning on working with them. So that's a good question. Has an agent taken you out and shown you any properties? Yes. If yes, how is it going? Are you planning to use them as your realtor? Okay. If they say yes, okay, that's awesome. I know that agent. They're great. I wish you the best of luck. If you if they're calling on your listing, you can say. I'd be happy to let them, I will give them a call and answer any questions through them that you have about my listing, right? Assuming they say no, now you know this is somebody that you could potentially represent. So then the next question, is there anybody else buying the home with you, right? Um, who will be living in your home? How long have you been looking for a home? Here is a trick that I use at open houses. Anytime you're at an open house, you want everybody to sign in. They have to sign in. This is number one security and um, number one thing. There, don't do an open house if you're not going to collect the names. It's a, it's a waste of your time. You're just then sitting in a house for two hours <laughs> for no results. So you're at an open house. You want everyone to sign in. Usually people come to open houses in pairs and um, what, what one person's like signing and the other person just kind of standing there. The easiest question to ask them is how long have you been looking for a home? It opens up like a whole dialogue usually with the person so that you can start again. You want to start building rapport with this buyer over the phone. I'm curious, why are you moving, right? This is where you might discover that they're selling their house and they need to buy another one. And then ding, 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 you've now picked up a listing and a potential buyer, right? So that's an important one. Curious, why are you moving? Are you renting now or do you own? They might have already asked, you know, they might have answered this at the previous one. So if they did, don't ask it again. Do you know when your lease is up? This is important. This is important. This is something that I don't think I necessarily understood how to explain to somebody when I was first starting out is the timeline for finding a home. People have in their heads 
a certain timeline that they think things are going to fall into. It doesn't always work that way. And sometimes people will say, like, if somebody said my lease is up in October and I need the end of October and I need, and I cannot renew my lease, you need to get them into a house this week if they're pre approved. Like, they need to write an offer immediately. Sometimes buyers will think, I have until October and it's only August. And what they're not baking into the equation is that it could be 60 to 90 days once they get an accepted offer on something to actually be in a position to close. And that doesn't take into account any search time. And in this market, having to write five, six, seven, 10, 15, 20 offers on something to get a house. So if you have 30 or 45 days of search time plus three, you know, 60 to 90 days worth of close time. If they're in the mindset that my lease isn't up for six months, I have plenty of time. They probably actually don't really have plenty of time. And so we have to help them understand that, right? Even, and so sometimes this is, this is one of the opportunities where you can really show up as, as a knowledgeable um, fiduciary to these people is by understanding what their timeline is and then helping them understand what the timeline is for buying a home. Um, and, and so if you sell, and then the next question, obviously, if they are not a renter, you would ask them, do you need to sell your current home before you buy your next home? This is something else that is very, very important to know. If you're going out with somebody and they need to sell their home in order to buy the next home, that is important. That means that has to be included on any purchase offer that you write, right? So any purchase offer that you write with this person needs to say, accepted offer, whatever the status of their home is. Here is a hint, especially in this market. If they need to sell their home in order to buy a home, they cannot wait until they find the home that they want to get their house on the market. You will get, you'll get this objection a lot. I've had this conversation many times with buyer, with people because they don't, they don't understand the logistics of it. And I totally understand the mindset of, well, I like my house, but I want a bigger house, but I, I'm not going to risk, you know, having to buy something I don't want because when I list my house, it's going to sell very fast. And I can understand that standpoint. And logistically, if they have to have a sale contingency on their offer, they need to at a minimum have a buyer on the hook and probably need to be a little bit of the way through the process in order to get a seller to even consider an offer with a contingency like that, especially in this market, especially in this market. Buyers are not going to be helped if they need, you know, in this market, if they need sell, big seller concessions, if they have a home to sell, if they're using certain types of loans, I hate to say it, but it is, it is the truth. So those are some of the things we have to advise them on. So that conversation might look like, okay, so you need to sell your home before buying the next home. Have you signed a listing agreement with a, with a real estate agent to sell your home? Right? That's some good information to know right there. If the answer is um, no, okay, great. So, um, so when we meet to go over um, homes, I would love to talk to you about listing your home for sale. This is why this is important, you know, and explaining everything that I just went through in terms of having a conversation with them. That if they need the funds from their home in order to buy the next one, they're going to need to at a minimum have a buyer on the hook for the home that they're selling before they're going to be in a position to write any type of offer that a seller is going to consider on the other end of it, right? So they have to get their home on the market. And, and what you can um, let these people know is because this is the next thing. Well, what if I can't find the house? You can put in the listing that it's contingent upon the seller finding suitable housing. That's an okay thing to put into the listing, right? So that's the way that it would go. If you're wondering like logistically, how does this work? So you list the house, you'd put into the agent remarks, this home is contingent upon seller finding suitable housing and that, you know, if they're actively looking, that they're actively looking, right? And then you can say, listen, Mr. Buyer Seller, I definitely don't want you to just jump on any old home that you see, right? And so that's definitely not going to be our strategy. What we want to do is be in a position to write the strongest offer possible when we find the home that you want. And so we need to get your home on the market and get a buyer in place for your home. And we're going to let that buyer know that you're not going to sell the home to them until you have the home you're planning on buying. And then you can benefit from both sides of things, right? So now you've sold your home and then 
and then um, you've bought it. So, so that might be a fear that somebody has that you have to walk through with them. Okay, now here is the next question, question number seven. Are you going to be paying cash or will you be getting a mortgage for the purchase of your home? Notice this question is not, have you been pre-approved for a mortgage? Don't ask that question. That's a bad question. Have you been pre-approved for a mortgage? That's not the question. Lots of people have cash, right? And a lot of buyers, as you're talking to them, become defensive when you're asking them if they've been pre-approved, it's like this weird psychological wall sometimes can come up. So much easier to way to ask it is, are you going to be paying cash or will you be getting a mortgage for the purchase of your home? And then it's cash or mortgage. Great. If they say mortgage, awesome. Have you been pre-approved by a lender? It's either yes or no. If yes, great. Who are you working with? If no, do you need a lender recommendation? Right? Then you want to ask them, what, what have you been pre-approved for? What does your budget look like? Do you know how much your down payment is going to be? Do you know your loan type? Can you share that with me, right? The next question is, is anyone else involved in your home buying purchase? Those are the, whoever else is involved should be at the showing. Whoever else is involved should be at the showing. It's a, it's a big headache. Sometimes it's unavoidable, but it's a big headache when you're only, when you have to show every house twice. You got to show it to the wife first. Then when, the, then when she finds the one she likes, you got to go back with the husband. You got to show it to the, the kids first. And then the, but the parents are actually going to be the one that make or break. Anybody who's worked with first-time home buyers know there, a lot of times there's parents working behind the scenes on these deals. And so if they're not going to write an offer until mom or dad comes and looks at the house, mom and dad should come look at all of the houses. That might be a different opinion than other realtors. But that's my opinion. If mom and dad are going to be able to walk into a house and say, you're not buying this house, then they should be at all the showings. And the reason why that's important is because I've had this literally happen before. I had my first time homebuyers, they had a shoestring budget. And so we looked at all of the options and we wrote an offer on one. And the house was smaller than the house that ideally that they wanted, but it was in perfect condition. It was a, it was a flip, but it was a flip done really, really nice. So we got an accepted offer on that house. We had looked at a million other options. We get to the home inspection. Mom walks into the home inspection and literally says, you are not buying this house. So you might as well just tell the inspector to wrap it up and, and see if you can pay him a discount because there's no way you're buying this house. Okay, guess what happened? They stopped the home inspection and they canceled the deal. They didn't buy the house. And so sometimes what happens is when you have these other people that are involved in the home buying decision, if they're not there to see all of the options to see that the one that they've chose is the best out of all of their options, it's hard for them to quantify what they're walking into, right? Like the mom was walking into that house and all she was seeing was that the space was too small. She wasn't seeing that the other 10 options for them we're going to need twenty to thirty thousand dollars worth of work, or we're in a location that they didn't want to live in, or had bad yard space, and that was more important to them, right? So they're not seeing that whole thought process that you work through with the buyer. They're just seeing the end result. So that's one of the reasons why you want to ask: Is anyone else involved in your home buying decision? As you're showing homes, if this keeps happening with a certain buyer, where they, you show it to them and then they have to bring so and so back to look at the house. Just say, hey, why don't we just do this the easier way and have so-and-so come with us to the showings? The times that I've done that, I've gotten them to write an offer much quicker because the person's there seeing the full scope of the situation. And then a lot of times that person then becomes on your side as the realtor because they feel like they're bought in on the, on the decision instead of being against or coming in hot against like a realtor. Sometimes there's that strange perception. Okay, next question is on a scale of one to 10, 10 meeting you must buy a home as quickly as possible. And one meeting you're not sure you'll really buy anything. How would you rate yourself? If, if they rate themselves anything less than a 10, the follow-up question is what would it take for you to become a 10, right? And then when they answer that, answer anything else, anything else, anything else until they go, nope, that's it, great. Now you know all of their contingencies. And you've gotten to know them really, really well. When do you need to be in your new home, right? And then you want to set an actual consultation 
so that you can go over your buyer packet with them. You can go over the market with them. You can start to compile a list of homes that they might be interested in seeing, right? Now, one thing um, that I would add to this sheet is to ask them, what are they looking for in a home? I'm, is there another, I'm surprised this is not on this sheet. I guess they're just saying for this one, this is kind of how you pre-qualify somebody. Here is the, the truth and probably not the way that they want me to train you. Most buyers aren't gonna get in a room with you after this phone call and sit and go through a whole presentation the way that a seller will, right? So you have to be able to kind of meet people where they want. So there is an, a middle ground between that first conversation of when do you want to see the house? Great. Are you working with a buyer? Have you been pre-approved? Great. Let me schedule a showing and come sit with me for an hour and listen to my spiel and why you should work with me. And then I'll get to your house. Like until you build a relationship with a buyer, you're just somebody standing in the way of them going to see a home right? You got to get them, you got to get them moving. So normally when I would do this, I would do this plus a buyer consultation where I pivot this into, okay, great. Now tell me about the home that you're looking for. Okay. And then you want to get a bunch of parameters, right? You want to ask a bunch of questions, get a bunch of parameters so that you're kind of narrowing down a way that you can set up a saved search for them. So you want to ask them a bunch of questions, um, let them give you the information that they want for the home that they want, right? And then at the end, you can say, okay, um, okay, I would be more than happy to help you with your home search, Do you, uh, but I only work with committed buyers who are only going to work with me. I only show homes to, to buyers who have decided to actually engage me in representation as their buyer's agent, right? You might at that point go into, and by doing that, you are going to be able to work with me. I watch the market every day. I have this really cool app on my phone that I'm going to send you so that we can talk back and forth about homes you're interested in. You're going to get access to homes really quickly. Whatever your value proposition is for your property, you're going to talk to them about that. And then you're going to get their buy-in to work with you exclusively, and you'll be their buyer's agent on the property. Okay, You want to make sure that you get that buy-in. Okay, once you have that buy-in, then you want to future pace them. So this is what I would say next. I'm just gonna show off my screen now. So this is what I would say next. Okay, great. So we're gonna work together and here's the next step. You have it, if there's gonna be two different tracks. Okay, you haven't been pre-approved for a mortgage yet, but you're gonna need one to buy a house. That's okay. What I'm gonna do as soon as we hang up is I'm gonna email you a list of my trusted vendors that work with my clients. Um, you're free to use whomever you choose. However, these are people that have done good by my clients in the past. And so I'm going to get that list to you. When do you think you'll be able to get your pre-approval by? Okay, great. Perfect. All right. In the meantime, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go on to the system and I'm going to pull homes that have blah, 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 whatever the criteria is that they just gave you. And I'm going to send you an initial list of homes to review. Take a look at them and let me know if there's any that you're interested on that list. You can also let me know if I'm totally off base and I didn't pull homes that matched at all what you're thinking about. And that's okay to say too, I wanna learn really about what you're interested in doing. Now, in addition to that, I'm gonna set you up with what's called an auto alert. That is going to email you homes as soon as they come on the market. Usually before they hit the major search portals, you're gonna get that home in your inbox to review, okay? And, and I'm going to set the search, I have to set parameters. So I'm gonna set the search parameters at blah, da, 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 da. Is there anything you want me to add or subtract? Okay, great, so that's gonna be your search. You wanna ask that because you will hear from buyers sometimes like, oh, my realtor keeps sending me e uh, homes that I told them I don't want a, anything smaller than an eight foot deck. And they keep sending me things with, well, that's not a search parameter in the MLS. So like you, you, you cannot customize the searches to that level. I usually would explain that to people as well. I would say, listen, you can make a choice. I look at the market every day and I can send you as I see them, I can send you homes. And in this market, homes are moving very fast. So I would, so what I would prefer to do is to have an auto search set up so that the minute the listing agent hits send on the MLS and post the listing, you get an email with it, which, but it's up to you. Which one would you prefer? Do you want more of a customized search 
where I'm going to, I'm really going to look and like kind of curate a list for you. Or do you want like instant access to anything that could be a possibility? Just let them choose. There's no right or wrong answer to the question. Just let them choose because then you're going to get buy-in from them, right? That's the key. You want to get buy-in from them to keep from that objection of my real, you'll hear this. Oh, I worked with this realtor and all she did was she sent me all these houses. None of them matched what I wanted. Okay. So, all right. If they want the quick solution, the, the instant solution, great. These are the search parameters that I have access to within our system. I can't make it any more in detailed or in depth. So, so let me, again, you just asked them a question. So I can't put in there that it's only an eight foot or larger deck. So is it okay that I just put in deck and then you might sometimes get something that's smaller or do you not want me to include it at all? And then you're just going to get anything, whether it has a deck or not, right? Or a pool or not, or whatever it is. Just let them choose. Again, I think sometimes we think, we try to think through how we have to do it. And then if you guess wrong, then you're, they get aggravated. So just let them, give them the opportunity to pick what they want their safe search for. Okay, so that's the three things you're going to do at the end. So you're going to do the full questionnaire, right? Then you're going to go into a little bit about the benefits that they're getting from working with you. You're going to get them mortgage broker names if they need to be pre-approved. If they've been pre-approved or they're paying cash, you're going to ask them to send you the pre-approval letter or the pre or the proof of funds, right? So somebody paying, um, paying cash needs to provide proof of funds. Proof of funds can either be a bank statement that they can redact. They can redact everything except for like their name and the balance in the bank statement. They can redact whatever else they want. All of their transaction history, they can redact. They can redact the obviously account numbers. Make sure when they send you, do them, a, do them a solid. And if they send you proof of funds that has their account numbers all over it, redact it for them. You don't want to send that out to the public, right? Make sure that you do that. If, if you hear from a buyer that is like, I'm not sending you my bank statements, that's no problem. What budget do you think you're going to be looking in? Great. What I need you to do then is call your bank and they'll be able to issue you a letter saying that you have liquid funds up to that amount. And that's what we can use instead of your bank statement. So people are going to want to go either one or one or the other way. So that's what you're going to want to do. So you do that, you get that down. Then again, you future pace them. Okay. So you're going to future pace them and say, okay, so this is what's going to happen next. I'm going to send you an initial list of homes to review. I'm also going to set you up on a saved search so that as new homes come on the market, you're going to get access to them immediately. Now, here's the final question. Are there any homes that you've seen so far that you know you're already interested in seeing? I would say nowadays it's 70% of the time there's homes that they're already interested in seeing. Okay, great. When they say yes, okay, awesome. What are, what are those addresses? Let me jot them down or just text them or email them to me if you don't have them handy. Now that also can open the door to, okay, awesome. Can I ask, how were you finding those homes? How, what were, what, where did you see those homes, right? You're going to hear probably one of three questions, uh, answers. Zillow, realtor.com, they're on some other agent's email list or some other office's website searching for homes. Okay, great. Whatever the answer is, it's always, okay, great. That's great. Hey, so um, this other thing that I'm able to provide my clients with is I have my own personally branded app. The benefit, I'm going to send you the link. Would you rather me text or email it to you? They'll tell you, okay, awesome. I'm going to get that over to you. You want to download it. And then I'm going to be registered as your agent. See, what happens if you continue to search on Zillow or Realtor.com is anytime you click on something, you're going to get, your phone is going to be flooded with realtors that are going to try and talk to you, right? And I'm sure that's not what you want. Are you looking, do you want to be in conversation with like 50 different realtors on any given day? They're going to be like, no, great. All right. So I have the solution to that. You're never going to have to talk to another realtor. Just go on to my app. I'm going to send you the link that way. I'm the only person that's going to see your information. And you're the only person you're going to hear from is me. You don't have to deal with um, searching on the public search portal. Okay. So now here's the other thing you're going to be able to do through my app. You can ask me questions on properties. You can request showing through my app. And then you can tell me when your availability is. 
you can set up collections. Um, you can set up collections within the app and you can label it like Saturday showings. And then I'm going to have a list of the properties that you're interested in seeing on Saturday. I can also um, set, I will also, the save search is also going to come through command. Do the save search through commands. Don't do it through the MLS. And let me tell you the benefit. Command is going to pull listings from every MLS in the country. When you put, when you create a safe search for a buyer in the Ulster County MLS or in the Hudson Gateway Association of Realtors or Columbia Green Northern Duchess or wherever your MLS is, it will only sell, send them homes when they're listed within that MLS. So then what happens if you're, if you are somebody that works with people, I know this is particularly applicable for my agents in my office um, who work across five or six MLS systems and second home buyers who will go anywhere two hours outside of New York City in the Hudson Valley. It creates this massive like area that people want to search within and it makes it very difficult to do the safe searches. You're, you either end up setting them up on multiple MLS safe searches, which you could do. And when an agent lists a property across multiple MLSs, they're going to get like five different alerts. They're all formatted differently. There's different portals. It's not super user friendly. When you set them up with the safe search through command, which you can do right in their contact card, if you need help on doing this, find your, low, your nearest ASC and they will help you understand how to do this. Set them up on a safe search so that all the listings are going out um, through command. So here's a tip, set yourself up on, on a safe search so that you can see. I set myself up on a safe search just because I wanted to see what the emails looked like when they were going out. They look way nicer and more professional than the ones that come out from the MLS. They have a preview of the house. There's a little note that it looks super professional. So set them up on a safe search that way. And then any MLS that the house pops up on, it doesn't matter what MLS it's on. It's going to pop up and then it's going to email out to your clients. And then you'll be able to see if they click the email, if they click the link, if they start looking at the house. Because what happens is what the link that gets emailed out is linking them back to your Keller Williams website. So again, the link that emails out to them, when they click on it, they're going to get back to your personally branded website so that anytime that they log in, they want to ask a question, they want to schedule a showing, they want to do whatever it is, they want to save the property, it's on your website so that in your command database, you can see everything that they're doing and you're alerted to it so you can follow up with them appropriately. Okay, any questions about anything we've covered so far about doing that initial kind of buyer consultation, getting a buyer to the point where you have gone through the thing with them and you ask them all the questions and you future pace them in terms of what's gonna happen next. No? Hi, Rita, I have a question. Awesome. Uh, I actually uh, had uh, had buyers uh, came to my open house and I follow up with them and they keep telling me that they're not working with any agent, but they they don't want to work with one. And they say, oh, thank you. Like I send them um, other houses that I promise I will send them to see what else in the area. And they said, please don't. Um, like basically don't waste your time. We see them because we're on Zillow and Redfin. We uh, see, we can search ourselves. We do it like every minute we see. Um, like, so basically what you send us, we already saw. And um, we don't want to work with any agent. We're just going to go through the houses and look ourselves. Yeah. That, so you hear that a lot. That's not uncommon. A lot yeah. of buyers. That's most, so, I would say that's mm -hmm. most buyers' mindset is that, right? So I think that it, it is getting really clear on what your value proposition is as a buyer's agent. So I might ask them, well, that's great. And you know what? The truth is most buyers end up seeing online the home that they end up buying first. That's where homes make their first impression. Um, mm -hmm. what, what I know is going on in the market right now is that pretty much everything is going into multiple offers. So who's going to help you negotiate on your behalf a strong offer when you find the home that you want to buy? Yeah, that's what I basically told them too. I said, well, when you when you will find a house you like, you will need to have an agent to be able to negotiate. Uh, and you can't, because they, they told me, 
I was like, how you go see the houses? They said, we contact the listing agent. I was like, when well, then there will be conflict on, of interest. They can't represent you. You need an agent and they can't get it. There's like, it's okay. We will be, we will be doing it. Like me and my wife, we're searching for homes. <laughs> yep. So th- sometimes um, the key to consulting somebody is moving, switching from making statements to asking mm-hmm. questions. Mm-hmm. So you have the exact perfect information. And my suggestion would be to change that into a question. Um, do not start the question with the word why. Why makes people defensive? Okay, mm-hmm. so make start it with what or how and allow them to answer the question. Because when you're saying, oh, you're, you're not wrong, you're saying to them like, no one's going to, there's going to be a conflict of interest. Like you're not going to have anybody negotiating on your behalf. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, no, I, I have this point of view and you're telling me a statement and that's not going to make me change my point of view. Right. If mm-hmm. instead that question might look like, so help me understand if you decide to write an offer on that, how is the agent representing the, the seller going to be able to negotiate a good deal for you? <laughs> well, okay, I didn't ask that question, but I asked them other questions and they just not responding. Yeah. Like I asked them, but have you been pre-approved? And they didn't say anything. Right. Well, you have to get into part of it too is get is getting into the conversation, like being able to build rapport with with a buyer. Mm-hmm. Because you're right. A lot of times buyers are defensive. They want to just go in and see the property. And, Mm -hmm. um, and they might not be super motivated to buy something right now, right? Like if we know that most buyers will look kind of like either online or in other ways for three to six months before they- They've been looking for a year, they say. Right. So they're not super, probably super motivated, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, and they, they, and it sounds like they need a little consultation, right? You have to build a rapport with a buyer before- they're going to open up and say, I have a pre-approval or I'm paying cash. Like you might change it. The, the question, like we went over on the questionnaire to be, are you planning on paying cash or will you be getting a mortgage? It's like kind of a closed option. Like it's one or the other. Right. <laughs> and, and, um, mm-hmm. and so see what they say with that. And sometimes this is the truth. There are, many buyers in the world out there and sometimes you can you can ask it as a question and you can consult somebody and you can explain it to them and you can do all of these things and they will still be dug into their beliefs Mm -hmm. and the 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 answer then is just go lead generate for more buyers the more that you're lead generating for buyers the more buyers you have to pick from in terms of who you decide to work with because you get to decide to work with the person just as much as they get to decide to work with you. Right. Okay. <laughs> so if you're, if well, you're, I'm just starting. So every buyer for me is like, Oh my God, I have this lead. But. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I get that. I was that way too. And buyers are just Elena buyers are rough. They, they really are. I hate to be so you know, yeah, they're, they're negative, ignoring, but they're, they're, I've rough. been ignored and, so many times. <laughs> yeah. You really want to get good buyers because a bad buyer will just beat you to death. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. I mean, and well, listen, sorry. <laughs> you can get, and also I don't want to be the person that sits here and is like, there's an answer to everything. Like that's not, you could work around all of this. No, I've had clients that I've run around with for a year and they didn't buy anything. And then you saw, and I stopped hearing from them and there was, is no amount of coaching or consulting or answers mm-hmm. that I could have come up with to, to have that situation not happen. I think the, the mindset has to be on, like we were talking about earlier, a big enough goal, like a big enough lead funnel that if one buyer falls off the face of the earth, you have another 10 buyers that you're working with, right? Like mm-hmm. that's one of the reasons why I was giving the example of when I put all these deals together, that was like my only focus. I already made my money with those people. Like they were already my clients. They're under contract. Like the deal's going to close and I'm going to get paid. What I what I what needs to happen is a constant shift 
to think about every day, how am I adding new people into my pipeline? And then how many people do I need to be talking to on a daily basis, knowing that there's never going to be 100% of the people that you talk to that are going to end up being your clients. And the people that end up being your clients, 100% of them are never going to end up buying and selling a house. There's always going to be fall off for that. And sometimes it's unavoidable. And sometimes and it's the, like this situation, you could say everything right, and they don't get it. And that's okay. I would probably make the decision that they are not either super motivated or worth it. And then I would go back and instead of using that time talking to them, just go back and find some more buyer leads, right? That's a good yeah. way of thinking. Yeah. And remember the best way to get buyers is to have listings, right? Yes. If you have listings, you'll get the best buyers. Yeah. <laughs> so, right. right. Well, yeah. they were from open house. But I don't know. Yeah. Maybe they were not motiva motivated enough. Yeah, I mean, some people, mm -hmm. I think, go, it's the open houses, it, you get a sliding scale of people. Sometimes you get the looky loo neighbor. Sometimes you get people that they like to drive upstate and it's fun to come to open houses. It gives them like a destination and they come and look at the open house and then they go to lunch and they go in, you know, like, so they're not super motivated. And then sometimes you do get the buyers that come right in are super motivated and you're able to convert. But it's it's a numbers game, right? It's sale. Any type of sales business is always going to be a numbers game. So it's just getting enough people in that top of the funnel that we were looking at before. Because if you notice, as the funnel keeps going, it gets smaller and smaller. And it's it gets smaller and smaller because you have people falling off at each step of the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So you need enough people in the top so that you have enough people falling <laughs> off to still help you hit your conversion ratios. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. A, you're welcome. That's a good question. What uh, other questions? Could I there? make a comment on that? Yeah. Yeah. I used to do a lot of open houses and I also discovered doing that there are some people who just make a hobby of going to open houses and they're going to show up at every open house every week. And they're not really no. They were renting. Buy. They said they were renting in the area, and they were looking to buy. So yeah, but they may not really be committed to buying. They're just like, if I see something that just maybe in not my dream home, I'm going to buy. Yeah. You know, probably so kind of a waste of time when they're like that. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say it, but sometimes those are the buyers that then they find the house and they're like, we'll just offer like fifty thousand dollars less than asking and see what happens. It's right, Lori. <laughs> like somebody with that mindset is also the one that when you get to the time of they're like, oh my God, I'm dying for this house. I want it so much. And you're like, great, there's multiple offers. And they're like, well, I have cash. So I'm going to offer $20,000 under asking, but I'm the only, I could po only possibly be the only person in the Hudson Valley that can pay cash for the property. Right. And it's just not the case. Right. So I think part of Part of honestly doing that long buyer questionnaire instead of the, hey, let me get you into a house. Because think about it. If you have that quick conversation with somebody of, I'm interested in seeing one, two, three Main Street. Great. Are you working with a realtor? Are you pre approved? Are you paying cash? Perfect. Send me proof of funds and I'll get you a schedule for tomorrow. Now, think about what that involves on your end. So now you've, now you've hung up the phone. Now you have to spend at least 15 minutes getting the showing scheduled. If you're preparing for the showing the way I used to prepare for showing, probably 10, 15, maybe if they're seeing a bunch of houses, it could be an hour of preparation. Then God knows where you're driving. We cover a huge track of land. You could be driving 45 minutes away at a few, our agents in our office to show the house. Then you're in the house with them for 45 minutes. Then you're driving back home. Then you're setting them up on all this follow-up stuff. So you're talking about hours and hours of time you could be spending to just to to um, that you could avoid by having a little bit of a longer conversation up front, right? So having a big enough lead system and lead funnel so that you have enough leads coming in so you can filter out the ones that are just the looky loos or not super motivated or are gonna be time wasters or not reasonable with the current market. So that when you get down to the people that you're actually showing the houses to, you've already built, built rapport with them. You understand what they're looking for. They, are, they have buy-in and working exclusively with you as a real estate agent. And then, then as you're doing that, you'll end up getting a return for your, for your money. 
buyers are tough. And in this market, it's tough. Like um, when I first got licensed, it was a buyer's market and it was totally different. Like it was like you, not that you didn't want listings then, but like listings were the bigger headache then. Cause you're like, oh, I'm going to list this house and I'm going to have to offer like a free cruise to the people to buy it. Like that was like the market was like, we'll pay all of your closing costs and moving fees and all of these things. Like, and the buyers could come in and negotiate a great deal and negotiate in the seller's concession. And so it was, it's just, a di it's always going to be a different market right now. It's tough for buyers. Buyers want to deal. I want to deal when I buy something, right? I'm sure I, there's nobody on this call that is like, I want to buy something and I want to be taken. I want to be on the short end of the stick and totally get the wrong side of the deal on it. Like be totally taken on this deal. And that's how buyers honestly feel right now. And so it, it, there's a lot of things we can do to become consultants. I do think when you're listing a house, it's sales and it's marketing. And when you're helping somebody buy a house, it's service, right? Like your ability to provide a high level of customer service, your ability to really coach um, your clients and explain the market and help them navigate the process from contract to close using a bunch of different touch points will get you repeat business. Remember, every buyer you help buy a house, at some point will sell that house. Someone will sell that house. They're gonna, so they will sell that, at some, they're not gonna own the house in perpetuity for the next 200 years. So every buyer you have is going to be somebody that could four or five equal out to four or five real estate commissions over the life of it. I know people are like, oh, first time home, first time home buyers, you're helping them buy their first home. They don't know what on earth they're doing. So you're walking them through the process. Now they're living in their first home. I would say over the past 18 months before I stepped out of production, a lot of my business came from my first time home buyers that I had helped five or six years ago that now we're looking to sell because the market was up and they were doing whatever. They were moving some, they wanted to move up house. They wanted to, they were relocating and I helped them do that. Like whatever it was, um, the, your first time home where you catch them there, you catch them, then you can sell the house for them, help them buy another one. If it's like a move up home, sometimes in the mix there, if they're making more money, they might decide to invest in real estate. I have a number of people that have invested. I just got an email from one of my past clients yesterday that said, I just got my real estate license and I want to join Keller Williams. Like he's going to come on board and I'll, I'll make profit share from him. Right. So if he needs me a sponsor, he might, he might, or he might know somebody else here. But if he does, I'm going to make profit share from him. Right. So they have this cycle buyers that they'll buy and sell if you catch them at some point. The key to doing that is to have that long follow up. If it's seven or eight years in between and you're, the idea is to talk to them a, a bunch of times during the year, that's a lot of follow up you have to do with buyers to get to keep yourself to be top of mind. Right. For most realtors, it's very difficult to do. That is why our technology exists. That's why command exists in the world, because we know realtors aren't super great at that. I'm not. I can't come up with 36 unique things to say to somebody during the year. But the good news is I don't have to be like I can put them into the system, turn them onto a safe search. Once they buy something, put them on a past client drip talk to them four times a year and everything else is automated. A newsletter is automated, um, market updates automated, client event invites automated. All of that stuff can go on behind the scenes so that when it's time for them to make their next home buying decision, you're now the listing agent plus the buyer's agent, right? Is there also an opportunity during that seven years to get referrals from them? If you provide a high level of customer service to a buyer while they're buying the property, they will, they absolutely will know other people that are buying properties. John, I know you work with second home buyers. They know other people that are moving upstate, right? Where they know one, other people are coming up, right? Yes, he's saying yes. He's nodding. Yeah, right? What happens when, okay, you just bought this beautiful upstate property and my friends came up and they splashed in the pool with me all weekend and they barbecued out on the deck and they were like, oh my God, this view of the ridge is beautiful in the back. And then what happens? They're like, I want my own upstate house. Awesome. You've got to talk to my friend, John. Right? But they do that because you provide a high level of customer service for them. So you should think through a little bit, like, what does that look like for you? It's going to look different for all of you, right? 
but what is your value proposition and how do you develop that for our buyers and sellers? If you're saying that's awesome and I, and I don't know and I want some more information on that, well, you're in luck. That is the next session of Ignite. So tomorrow, the next session of Ignite is how to build a value proposition. So that is how to understand how do you provide a high level of customer service for your clients so that you they want to tell everybody, scream from the rooftops that you are the awesome, best realtor in the world, that they want to go on to Zillow and leave you reviews and onto your Facebook page and leave you reviews after the sale that will help you get more business, right? The, your value proposition will also be helpful as you go to network yourself, go to networking events, develop an elevator pitch for yourself that in under two minutes, you can say what you do that is, helps people buy and sell real estate in the market. It will also help you when you're on buyer consultations, when you're on listing presentations, when they ask, I'm interviewing other agents, what makes you stand out? That's your value proposition, right? You all have a value proposition, even if you've never worked with a client yet, you have transferable skills that you've had in your past job, right? That you transfer to real estate and you are backed by the number one real estate company in the country. So just Keller Williams will give you a whole suite of value propositions that you can explain to a buyer or seller. So make sure you're here tomorrow. Um, the instructor is Vicki Wolpert, who is our top solo agent in our Kingston office. Vicki sells on average between 60 and 70 homes a year herself. Way more than I ever sold when I sold real estate. So, and, and I'm sure she would be the first one to say the vast majority of that is repeat and referral clients. And it's based off of her reputation in the area where she sells real estate. And so she is um, going to definitely be an expert on how to build that really solid value proposition for, for your clients. Okay, we have two more minutes. Any last um, questions that I can answer? Some ahas. I want at least two ahas from people in the class and then I'll let you loose. And if you do it under two minutes, then you'll be right on time. Otherwise, we're gonna be sitting here all day. You know, somebody learned something. Did I just talk for two hours and say nothing new? Wait, I, I have a question. I'm really sorry. Um, oh, great. Where, where's the awesome script that you just that you just walked us through? Like, I can't find it. Um, which script? The the sheet that sheet? Yeah, with I like will, I'll upload it right now into the chat as a file. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, ahas. What did you learn, John? I know you learned something. You're unmuted. You're muted. <laughs> uh, so there's a lot of, uh, I thought today was very motivating. Um, there's stuff that I've touched on, but haven't uh, really focused on too, um, or not focused on, but really haven't been diligent with. So going over some of like the economic model was really helpful today. Um, I've done that, but I need to revisit it as like the business has evolved. So um, it, that has been really great. Just also going over the conversations with the buyer, um, and like that question, the the you know, the the questions that we the pre qualification kind of um, uh, script that we were just talking about. Um, some of the responses, like how you would respond to some of those questions, uh, were really informative too. Um, so there's a lot of little nuggets uh, everywhere sprinkled throughout the, the presentation presentation today that I thought were helpful. Awesome. Okay. Well, John saved you all because he gave us more than one aha. So thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. And thank you to everybody for being here um, again tomorrow. Um, Vicki will be here teaching you guys. Um, and if there's anything I can do to help, um, my email, I'll put it in the chat. Please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always happy to answer any questions that you have about the class or help you all as you continue to grow your big real estate businesses for yourself. So thanks everybody. And I will talk to you all soon. And Thank hopefully so I'll much. see many of you on Tuesday at our mega camp event. Yep. Awesome. Thank you, Rita. You're thanks. welcome. All right, bye. Bye. bye.